see if that works okay. We're at least semi-functional. Asco mycota. Finally, we're getting to these organisms that are really crazy life cycles. These organisms that probably came from outer space. And you've seen a little bit of the weird stuff already with zygomycota, but it's gonna get a lot weirder now in the next couple weeks as we do ascomycota and basidiomycota. So we're gonna start with this group, the ascomycota. Mycota, of course, is the division ending for the fungi. Ascus means bag or bladder, but let's just call it bag, at least in how we write it. Well, let's bag or sac, because officially these guys are the sac fungi. And so there's gonna be some part of their structure, an essential part of their structure, that is a bag, a container. And I'll show you that here in just one second, because it is in fact the defining feature of this group. This group includes the yeast, so this is what's responsible for all the alcohol you drink, this group, the ascomycota. Yeast is a member of this group. The morels, so if you ever ate morels, or haven't, they're delicious, and they are going to occur in this group, the ascomycota. There's also a number of fungi that you probably haven't heard of, the brown molds, the pink molds, the green molds, the parasitic powdery mildews. Those are all parts of this. Powdery mildew you might have heard of since it's a pest of some agricultural plants. And we'll look at some of those later on, although we're not gonna do the brown, pink, or the green molds. <clears throat> Here's our classification we've been looking at. We are now in this group down here, which in this classification of the Eumycotina, the subdivision is in the <coughs> Ascomycetes, the class, but this is also, for us, then the Ascomycota. So we have just moved this up to division level compared to the author of this slide, who puts it at class level. Same organisms, exactly the same organisms. Characteristics? Well, there are some characteristics that are shared with all of the other fungi and some characteristics that are shared just with the Basidiomycota. And then there's something that makes these guys completely unique. One, a special characteristic that makes them completely unique, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So with all other fungi, they're absorptive heterotropes or saprobic. Saprobic means they're weak parasites. They're parasites of living material, but they don't kill that material. They don't usually kill the organism. So absorptive heterotrophs, they secrete enzyme outside their body and take in those liquid carbohydrates or liquid complex carbon compounds. There are no flagella. None of the fungi have flagella anywhere in their life cycles. <coughs> There's actually one small exception to that in the, pla in the cellular slime molds, which we'll do in a couple weeks, but a very small exception. None of these ascomycota don't, basidiomycota don't. With the basidiomycota, the group that we'll do next, they have, the perfor they have perforated septa, so they have septae, hyphae, zygomycota don't, zygomycota are siphonous and senocytic, these guys are septate, but they have holes in their walls. And those holes are very important for part of the life cycle we'll talk about late in this lecture or the beginning of next lecture. The cells can be uninucleate. Now, in the, what I'm gonna be writing here is the characteristics of ascomycota. Okay, so in red, it's gonna be ascomycota. Now, in black, it's shared with basidiomycota. So with basidiomycota, there can be uninucleate cells. In ascomycota, it's the majority of the life cycle. So the majority of the life cycle are in uninucleate cells. Dikaryotic cells, N plus N, make up a small percentage of the life cycle in the ascomycota. In the basidiomycota, it's gonna be most of the life cycle, spent in that dikaryotic stage. 
So here we have a small part of the life cycle. in the ascomycota. And then there are multinucleate gametangia that occur in the ascomycota. They are not so common in the basidiomycota. I'm actually trying to remember if they occur at all in the basidiomycota. Here is the characteristic that makes the ASCO, the ASCO mycota completely unique. So if an organism has this characteristic, it is a member of the ASCO mycota. And if it does not, it is not. So this is the, it's very unusual to have a whole division defined in this way, but it's true of the ASCO mycota. There's one characteristic, and that is the possession of an ASCUS. I'm gonna switch colors. And here is an ASCUS, this bag. And you notice there's a membrane, there's a cell membrane around it. So it's a unicellular structure. And it's composed of haploid ascospores. So these haploid ascospores are myospores. They originate from meiosis. Now, what do you know about meiosis? You start with a diploid cell from meiosis, and you end up with haploid and how many? Four. four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Hmm. What's going on? <coughs> how do we get eight cells? <laughs> Eight cells in the ascus originating from meiosis. Sorry? Four N. Four N. Well, each one is N because they're haploid cells. So if we went through meiosis twice, so we would have a meiotic cell division going from diploid to haploid. Can a haploid cell undergo meiosis? No. So we can't do meiosis twice, but you're on the right track. Meiosis and then mitosis. So this arises from meiosis, then mitosis. So these two, like this, these guys would come from a mitotic cell division. Right? And so this would be the first division of meiosis. This would be second division. And this is mitosis. I don't really have room to write. I'm just trying to write MIT here to show you that that's mitosis. So it's a pretty cool system, right? You got a little record there of the mitotic and meiotic and mitotic cell divisions all lined up in these things. So Neurospora was the Drosophila of genetics before Drosophila was the Drosophila of genetics. This was the model organism in the 50s and 60s. So almost all genetics was done on this organism. So it's really so it's a great experimental organism. It can be grown in petri dishes. It's much easier to work with than Drosophila, but Drosophila, for a number of reasons, turned out to be a more adequate model for what we wanted to do with human, as a model for human genetics and so on. So it's <clears throat> Neurospora, this organism, Neurospora, is not used very often anymore. So we have an ascus, it rises from meiosis, followed by a mitotic cell division. There are eight ascospores, <coughs> and they're haploid. Here we see them again in not quite as nice of a picture, but the ascus would be here, and the ascospores spores. 
So at, the word assi is plural, singular, ascus. Here is a fruiting body of Morcella. This is one of the morels. Many of the morels are subterranean and don't look quite as beautiful as this one, but this is one of the morels. And if we were to look here on these cups, this is where the assi occur. So the assi occur in those cup shapes. And this down here is the vegetative part of the organism or part of the vegetative part of the organism. And the hyphae are haploid here. Within the assi, there are some N and some N plus N cells. Not, I'm sure I don't mean to say within the assay, I mean within those cups, there are some haploid and some dikaryotic cells, <coughs> and then some also assay, which are not dikaryotic or monokaryotic. They're those strange eight-celled sacs, assay. We're gonna look at that in detail on the inside. Here's a section now through one of those cups. Again, this is Morcella. I don't think this one was not taken in lab, but you could see the same kind of thing in our microscopes in lab. I need a color that's going to work on that. Green works pretty well. Try that. Any red, green, green color blind people? I can switch to black. Okay with green. So here are the assay. And if you look closely, I'm going to switch to a different color of green here. I think you can see that. Maybe I'll try blue. Here is a cell that does not have any ascospores in it. If we look closely again, we can see part of that cell. Here's part of one of those cells, no ascospores in it. Here's one of the cells no ascospores in it. So are there are these sterile cells that are also within the ascus or within this cup-shaped structure. We'll get a name for the cup-shaped structure in a minute. These are sterile cells. And they occur beside the assi, and the assi are bags or bladders. And so these cells are called cells beside the bladders in Greek. And you might know that the folks from my lab already know this term from labeling the conceptacles in fucus paraphyses. Paraphyses, so para, beside, this is the bladder. Paraphyses. So a paraphyse is just a general sterile cell sterile cell like this that is adjacent to one of the reproductive cells. And if you haven't seen those yet, you will see those in lab today when you look at the conceptacle of fucus. And look at your lab manual, that is the photographic atlas for the bot botany laboratory, and that has the prophecies labeled in it, and you should label it in your photograph when you take a photograph today. So I saw it in a number of people from my lab, they labeled it correctly. So that's what a prophecies is. They occur in a number of organisms, and we'll see them again in other organisms. They're always going to have this stru structure, sterile cells, often with this elongate structure, and they're adjacent to the reproductive cells, in this case, adjacent to the assay. So that's the structure of that fruiting body. There are two really basic types of fruiting structures within the ascomycota. And within one of those types, there are three very important subtypes. 
now the main types are not really formally named. You could cheer at that point. There is not a term for it. This is the only time in the course we're going to say there is no term for that. Well, there is kind of, but here we have no fruiting body. There's, here's where there's no term. Oops, it's my computer, no fruiting body. So this is called then naked assay. <clears throat> so we see here's the ascus. They look a little different in this case. There are no sterile cells surrounding them, no parapheses and so on. This is the fungal cell, these here, this is the fungal cells. And then those cells down below them, these cells down here, this is all the host plant. So this is one of those parasitic powdery mildews. And this is the higher plant. Meaning the vascular plant that that powdery mildew is parasitic on or saprobic on. Okay, so that's the no term group, naked assi, no term in Greek anyway. I guess just to make up for that, we'll have two terms for this other group. Here we have a fruiting structure. And the only term we're really gonna use in this class, I'm just joking with you a lot this morning, is this term, which is ascocarp. There is another term that's used in the literature, I'll tell you that in a moment. We're not gonna use it in this class, you're never gonna see it on an exam and things, but you gotta recognize it's the same thing because you're gonna read these books. So an ascocarp, what does that mean? Asco, of course, refers to the ascus, and carp, as you know already, means fruit. So it's a really nice descriptive structure. These are structures that contain assi, and they've got sterile cells around them. All these cells are the fungi. They've got one of these three structures. There's another term, in fact, your book that your book uses, in fact, for the same thing, and that's an ascoma. And I really don't like this term. We've got the first part of the name the same, the root's the same. Oma means a morbid growth. So this term was really invented by a fungal hater. There are people out there, I just warn you, you're gonna encounter them in your life, you'll just have to learn to deal with it. There are people who hate fungi and they, they made this term. So what's a morbid growth about this? There's no morbid growth here. This is a beautiful structure, you can see. They're really cool, some of these structures. And some of them are delicious. So no morbid growths for us. We're gonna call them ascocarps, much more descriptive. So there are three types of them. And we'll go through them in some detail. The apothecium, the parathecium, and the cleistothecium. And let me go to the next slide and remind myself which one I'm doing first. I'm doing the apothecium first. So that's the cup shaped chakra we've seen already. Let's find our parts of the apothecium in this diagram first. The assi are easy to find. Here we have in blue, and they're not very nicely drawn here, the parapheses. And there are, like the parapheses, there are lots of sterile cells that are the vegetative body of the fungus. It's 
So it's the body of the fungus in the ascocarp. These cells that I've labeled in blue are haploid. The assi, it's, you know, it's hard to describe the assi, right? In these terms, haploid, diploid. The cells or the ascospores are haploid and they're contained in this structure, the ascus, and that's got eight haploid cells in it, haploid spores in it. So we don't have a clear term for that right now, but you know that the assi, the ascospores, are haploid. And we can write at least that on the screen. It contains <coughs> haploid ascospores. So the ascospores are here. I'm not going to switch colors here for parentheses. And then on the outside of that, which I can't easily label, outside of that would be the sterile cells. Surrounding it. So that's the apothecium. What does, we didn't do the name of apothecium. Apothecium means, in Greek, storehouse. So it isn't, we're not actually going to break those down, that down into roots. The root, sometimes a, root, a word, even though it has roots, is used as a whole word. You have these cases in English also, and apothecium means storehouse. You can look up the roots if you, if you want to for that. We're going to do the roots for the other ones. Parathecium is the next one. Peri means around. And thecium, just to make it confusing, is also means um, storehouse or box or cup. Let's do that, box, cup. Everything seems to mean box in Greek. We're box fixated around the box. It has the idea of a storehouse, though, thecium. OK. You can see that in this case, we have our sterile cells now surrounding, almost completely surrounding, the parathesis. So here we have the sterile cells. fungus and they are haploid. And then in the center, we have our assi and also our parathesis, which I'll draw in blue. So those sterile cells have come up and surrounded and enclosed, except for that one little hole at the top, the, the storehouse. Here's a parathecium. This was taken in lab, so you can get some really nice pictures on those microscopes. This was taken from a culture in the, in the lab. Here are our sterile cells. So you can also see that these things are, um, the parathecia can sometimes be quite small, and the cleistothecia can be sometimes quite small. So this is like under 10x of power. So this is a small, don't know the exact size, but a small organism. I can't show you the paraphyses here, but we can show you the assi, and you kind of get a sense that there are lines of cells down here, even though this has been kind of crushed. There's the assi. And here are some ascospores that have been squeezed out. So the ascospores are haploid also. The sterile cells are haploid. So there's a parathecium, a kind of ascocarp.
Here's another parathecium and a very interesting organism. So here is the parathecium. And you can see kind of in there the assi. And I'm not sure my blue is going to work. Maybe I'll do this in red, white. How about white? You can actually see in these the parapheses much better than you can see the assi. All this other stuff, this is all the higher plant that this organism is parasitic on. So this is all tissue of that plant. And if you look at that plant, what I haven't crossed out here, you can see that the cells are not very distinct there. This is either a really bad photograph or there's something really wrong with those cells. And there's something really wrong with those cells in this case. They've got the pipe, the pipe of the fungal hyphae are growing all through and parasiting this grain. It's probably it's grain, almost certainly, perhaps of wheat. This is a parasite on wheat, um, ergot it's called. It's a very important parasite in the sense that it's caused a lot of damage in the past. It's mostly controlled these days with fungal side, fungicides and so on. But in the past, especially in the Middle Ages, there was no control for this. And it wasn't even known that this organism parasitized grains. And so people would eat this wheat and they would have symptoms, very unusual symptoms, that would cause them to see um, what was called St. Anthony's Fire. Have you ever heard of St. Anthony's Fire? It's pretty obscure these days. You would see organ, um, trees and shrubs and other people with these halos around them. These colored halos would appear everywhere. Right, does it sound familiar? Good. It shouldn't fall. I don't want to see. Yeah. Ergot contains lysergic acid, a precursor of LSD. And so the people who were eating this were getting a little dose of LSD from this. And that St. Anthony's fire was caused, a symptom of LSD was seeing these colored halos around everything. A trip. They were taking trips on this. Now, it's an unregulated dose, and if you ate enough of this, LSD can be very, very dangerous. Let's do not take LSD, by the way. <laughs> um, and don't eat infected grains. <clears throat> but it's a very interesting story that these were interpreted as, and maybe even were, religious experiences. Certainly people in my generation who took LSD thought they were religious experiences and changed their lives. Um, not always in bad ways. Sometimes in really bad ways because they took away too much. But <coughs> I don't recommend it. I did not, and I don't recommend it. <coughs> so St. Anthony's Fire, from, from ergot controlled, now on this, from one of these parasitic ascomycota. The Kleistothecium. I didn't want that. Just one second, let me remember where I am and then I will answer the question. I felt tip pen there. Yes, question. I've heard that also. I've heard that this um, there was an effect from ergot on this on the witches or the people who were accused of being witches, the women who were accused of being witches at Salem. I haven't looked into that in detail, but I've also heard that. Okay, a Kleistothecium. So a Kleistothecium, it's kind of like a parathecium, except it's completely closed. There is no opening there. And the assi can have different forms. So here are the assi, the parapheses, are these other cells here, these sterile cells. And the sterile cells of the asco, asco, um, ascocarp are here outside.
Here's pictures again taken in lab. We can see the, we don't actually see the paraphyses here. Let me do the sterile cells on the outside. So these are the sterile cells. The T usually becomes before the E in sterile. And here are the assay. Here you see what they look like when they're shed. So they actually can be um, formed on the surface of leaves. These are parasitic ones. So we'll see them on the surface of grains when we have sections of them in lab next week. And they can be shed, and they have these little hyphal extensions sometimes on them. But those are, going, again, sterile hyphal extensions that are haploid cells. So the as another kind of aspocarp, the Kleistothecium. So there's two classes that we'll be dealing with in the Aspomycota. These next two slides introduce very quickly the two classes, and then we'll go through them in a little more detail. So the first of these classes is the Hemiaspomycetes. We know it's a class because of the ending Mycetes. That's the class ending. Mycota is the division ending. Hemi means approximately, sort of. Not the real thing. The difference between the hemiascomycetes and the other group, which is the uascomycetes, the good ones, the true ones, the true ascomycetes, has to do with the relationship between plasmogamy and karyogamy. And the hemiascomycetes is the situation that we've been learning all along. There's nothing special. So you ask my CDs that are the different ones. So these ones are the same. Plasmogamy and karyogamy occur together. That is, we can call the fusion of the gametes, syngamy, with no problem. The word syngamy works great here in the, US, in the hemiascomycetes. This is the group that has the yeast in it. Okay, so it's kind of weird we start with that one where there's no different, no big difference. But now let's look at the uascomycetes. The uascomycetes are very weird compared to what we've seen before. Now what, we're gonna go through this diagram at least three times in the next half an hour, maybe four. So we don't have to get, understand everything off of the diagram at this first time you're seeing it. What we need to understand is that here's plasmogamy over in this part of the life cycle. This other stuff happens in here, and here's karyogamy. So there's this, I don't want to say a long period of time, but there is a period of time where the organism exists in this unusual state where it is dikaryotic, so not all of the cells, but some of the cells in this part are dikaryotic. In fact, let me write that down here, n plus n. Some cells are dikaryotic in this space between plasmogamy and karyogamy. And then at karyogamy, we get those two nuclei fusing. In specialized cells of the organism, the two nuclei in the dikaryotic cell are going to fuse. And then after that, we get meiosis and the formation of the ascus. And that's all we need at this point. The main part point here is plasmogamy and karyogamy are separated in time, not close together. Really weird stuff now. So you didn't think organisms can do that, but they can. Okay, the hemiascomycetes. This is the group that has saccharomycetes in it. This is, these are the yeast. So these are the ones at least we're going to do are unicellular. And if we look in this life cycle for our stages, we'll find here is meiosis, and here is fusion of opposite mating trites, or syngamy. 
So we can draw our line that connects those two like this, almost like that, like this, which gives us our diploid stage and our haploid stage over on the right. And so we have a race of yeast cells, which are unicellular, which are haploid, and races of yeast cells, which are unicellular, which are diploid. And they look exactly alike. So they can be haploid yeast and diploid yeast look exactly the same as each other. The only You have to do some karyotic, karyotyping of them to figure out whether they're haploid or diploid. Both of these races, these cells, can undergo mitotic cell divisions for asexual reproduction. Now there's a special kind of mitotic cell division that takes place in these organisms. It's called budding. And I'll show you a picture of that in the next slide. Other than that, that's about it. It's a very simple life cycle. It's just a little unusual in that we have, it's completely unicellular. And it's, I guess you'd call that dibionic? I mean, usually we say there's a multicellular organism and there's not here, it's unicellular, but there are haploid races and diploid races. So I guess dibionic would work pretty well for this. Here's the process of budding, which is just a special type of mitotic cell division. So we can see here's the parent cell, and here is the bud, the little bud that comes off the side. Remember the desmids and how semi-cell generation, regeneration took in place in a desmid. The cell would divide at the isthmus, you'd have these two semi-cells, and then the semi from each new half cell, now a whole cell, the semi-cell would bud out of that, it would just flow out of that. We've got the same kind of process going on here. We have a parent cell, and there is this budding off in the process of mitotic cell division. So mitosis takes place the same way. We've still got mitosis taking place within the nuclei in that cell. It's just the process of cytoplasmic division takes place not by the formation of a cell plate down the center, but by the budding off of the cell, one cell from the other. So let's draw the life cycle. We're gonna do this very quickly, very quickly, because it's simple. So haploid above, diploid below, meiosis, syngamy. Syngamy gives rise to the zygote. And the zygote just produces lots of diploid unicellular individuals which undergo asexual reproduction through the process of budding. You can make a little drawing of a budding cell up here. We want to remember that this is budding. If we put a smile on that, it would look like a face. Now, what's our sporangium called in here? We don't have a sporangium per se, we have a what to give rise to the ascospores. Not sporangium? Ascus. So we have the ascus here, or the asci here, and that's where meiosis takes place, in that ascus. So we could even say the pre-ascus, but we'll just write ascus there or, and we could write in this case just to remind us that it's unicellular and naked. Unicellular naked ascus. Now there's actually one other weird characteristic of this ascus, and that in <clears throat> this group, the hemiascomycetes, and especially in the yeast, there are only four ascospores. It's an exception within the ascomycota, but there's only four ascospores here, not eight. So you can write that up here, four ascospores. And the ascospores just give rise to our 
haploid race of cells which undergo the process of budding, asexual reproduction to produce more of them. And two of these specialize into the plus gamete and the minus gamete and undergo syndomy. So it's a very straightforward life cycle. The only trick here is we've got our a unicellular ascus, and we only get four ascus, four is other. Slightly different term. If only it were that simple in the you ask Omycetes. It's not, and we're going to approach them though by first talking about asexual reproduction within these groups. These groups. So in the you ask Omycetes. We have asexual reproduction, and that <coughs> asexual reproduction is a very important way that these organisms can reproduce. It is so important that the spores which are produced are called conidia. And that means dust. Any ideas why it means dust? up there, all that stuff, it's all, we are swimming in a sea of Ascomycetes dust. The spores are every place in this air. Um, so they reproduce very, very abundantly. Let's look at some pictures of what those look like. So here are some conidia. Now the conidia, that's the spores themselves. Conidia is our plural. So one spore would be a conidium. These hyphae that bear the conidia are called conidiophores. And four means to bear. So conidio bearers, the hyphae that bear them are conidiophores. There's all different shapes of conidia fours. Here they really just look like hyphae, and they break up into the spores at the end, but they can look like different things. And we'll see this in penicillium. In the lab, we have some slides. I wouldn't say nice slides, but we have some slides where you can see the conidia and the conidia fours in penicillium. There are some races of penicillium, which give us, which is where penicillin was discovered, discovered of course, um, that reproduce only by conidia. Here's a another set of conidia. In this one, we have little warts on the surface of them. And down here, this would be the conidia four. And again, some other types of conidia. Now, in these cases, we have a higher plant. These are parasitic organisms. And this yellow stuff, this is all the higher vascular plant here. So you see it's labeled leaf epidermis. That's the higher vascular plant. So we're looking then at the fungal cells, which of course would be penetrating, the hyphae would penetrate all of this higher vascular plant, parasitizing it. And then they're coming out here, here underneath the leaf epidermis, and here forming a little st structure, which we'll name in one second. And in those structures, we have our, let me not use red for this. We have our conidia. So here are conidia. In this case, the conidia have two cells. So you can tell, if we were to filter this air, you can sometimes, not sometimes, you can very often identify these things, at least to genus, by the structures of the conidia, the structure of these spores. There's some, they have different shapes, they have different cellular structures. So they're not all unicellular, the conidia. Here's the conidia fours. Yep, they're even labeled here. There's one there. That's a conidia four. 
Over here, we have the canidia fours. They're kind of heart, um, Hershey kiss shaped. There's canidia fours. And the canidia look really different. The canidia look like these long spine shaped structures. So again, a very different shape of canidia. Now, this, these structures, like this one over here, as I say, are growing within a leaf. So this whole thing, then, it, when we look at it in a microscope slide, looks dense and dark compared to the, the leaves. The leaves, the cells of the leaf have huge vacuoles in it. So light, when you have a second light, just comes through. These don't have these big vacuoles, and so they look very dense in there. And so they're called little dense structures in Greek. The name in Greek is pycnidia. And make sure I get my roots right. I don't have them right here. Idia is a diminutive ending, and this is dense, something like dense. You can check it in your text. Or dark, so a little dense structure. Now, the pycnidia are not that important for us in the ascomycota, but I talk about them here because in the next group, the, as the basidiomycota, we're going to encounter structures that look almost exactly like this, but they're involved in sexual reproduction, and they're going to be very important to us in the basidiomycota. So I kind of get you ready for it here by talking about the pycnidia. And that's going to get us ready to understand these other really weird organisms, the basidiomycota, and the weirdest of all of them, which are the parasitic ones that we'll be doing near the end of last next week or the beginning of the week afterwards. Here's our last reminder that we have canidia and canidia fours. coming off of the hyphae in some of these groups. OK, so that's the, para, the uh, asexual cycle. That's asexual reproduction. We now need to start going around this structure and looking at sexual reproduction. And we're going to start over here with plasmogamy. Now, first of all, let's find our haploid hyphae. So I'm going to just put our haploid hyphae, even though they're different mating strains, I'm going to draw them here in green. So these are haploid. So here again we've got the haploid hyphae. And then we have multicellular, mul not multicellular, multinucleate <coughs> Gametangia. And they have special names. One of them you know, the Antheridium you know. And now the new one is Ascogonium. We'll come back to another slide and write that on the board. We're not going to do this once. We're going to do this two or three times because it's very new and different. So our Antheridium and our Ascogonium are going to fuse in plasmogamy, and that's what's shown here, the process of plasmogamy. That's here, plasmogamy. Let's look at that process in more detail now before we talk about where that big structure from the ascocarp comes from. So here we have it again. So here, see, I need different colors now. Here we have the haploid hyphae. I really should have saved my blue for the male nuclei. I'll use a different color of blue here. 
It's a different color. Yes, just barely. So here's our antheridium, and we have the male nuclei there. Let's go back. And let's take a nice girl color for the other ones. I don't have good girl colors here. What shall we use? It's probably as good as we can get with this pinkish thing. Salmon. I'm joking with you about girl colors. You didn't laugh, so you don't know I'm joking. Here's the ascogonium. <clears throat> So we know the roots for ascogonium really already, ascus, bag, bladder, gonium, reproductive structure. So it's the reproductive structure that's gonna form the ascus. The ascus, now that's not completely right yet. The ascus doesn't form directly from there, but we'll see the process in a minute. So it's the female side of this. It's the female side because those blue nuclei are gonna move through this tube. And you know what that tube is called? It's the female hair. It's the trichogyne again. So you can see that <clears throat> the mycologists really made a bad mistake here. They used the same term that occurs in the red algae. How are we gonna know that they're special if they do that kind of stuff? We have to have a little discussion with them. Well, the trichogyne occurs there, the female hair, and the male nuclei move through it. So the trichogyne is part of the ascogonium. Switch back to my warm color. There's the trichogyne. There's the trichogyne again. So it, <clears throat> these two strains grow, grow near to each other. The multinucleate gametangia are formed. The trichogyne attaches to the antheridium and the male nuclei move. And what happens from that then is shown over here in the next slide. I'm gonna label the female nuclei first because I've got the right color for it. I have to label every one. I'm labeling one of a pair. So these nuclei are gonna pair up. So I'm trying to find pairs of nuclei. It doesn't matter that you label exactly the same ones. Let me go grab the male nuclei now. And you see now they are gonna pair up in these new hyphae that are growing out of the ascogonium. So here's the antheridium, the spent antheridium. And out of the ascogonium, we have <coughs> dikaryotic hyphae <coughs> growing. So they didn't show the cell walls here, but there would be cell walls forming in these cells somehow to form dikaryotic nuclei, dikaryotic cells. Dikaryotic cells. Now there's another name for the dikaryotic cells. We're, remember those naked assay, we're making up for that now. Getting two terms for everything. <clears throat> what would you term this now? You had to make up a term for these dikaryotic hyphae that are growing out of the ascogonium. Ascogonium hyphae growing out, what would you call them? Yep, ask, it's gotta be ask something. They're ascogenous hyphae.
and the dikaryotic ascogenous hyphae grow out of the ascogonium. Here it is again. Okay, we'll do it again. Now I'm regretting I used all those colors. Here's the ascogonium, our female hyphae. Here's the trichogyne. Here's the anthridium. I don't know if you can see the blue there. And so they're going to now fuse with each other. I'm not going to do dots anymore. I'm just going to switch over here to red. Here's the process of fusion. This is plasmogamy. Of these multinucleate gametes or gametangia. And now here we're getting the dikaryotic or ascogenous hyphae growing out. Excogenous hyphae, N plus N is what we'll write down. So these escogenous hyphae now are going to grow out and they're going to eventually form the assay. So here's where we are. We've gotten plasmogamy to take place and we want to find the assay. Now the assay are going to occur they're not shown really well in this diagram, but there are going to be hyphae that come out of the ascogonium, and here they are. We can follow them up. These are the dikaryotic hyphae. I'm drawing in red here. And so the asci are going to be on the tips of those. What's the rest of this structure made out of? So I think we, what did we use? Green for the um, haploid? We use green now. Anyway, so there are haploid hyphae here, and we can follow those up too. So uh, most of this structure is composed of these haploid hyphae, and they're all intertwined here. haploid hyphae. So our ascocarp is composed then of some of the ascogenous hyphae, there's actually not that many of them, and mainly of the haploid hyphae that are, were, come from the parent organism, from the parent organism. So it's a combination of these different types of hyphae. And in there we're getting karyogamy taking place. Now here's a really beautiful diagram. I think this is one of the best diagrams that's ever been drawn in botanical illustration, not because it's the most beautiful one ever, but because it shows everything we want to show about these structures. So we can, if we trace this up, we can find, here's our sterile hyphae. They're making this outside of this. We can trace the sterile hyphae up. Look, the sterile hyphae are forming the paraphyses. There they are, the paraphyses. Trace them down and see that they don't come from the ascogonium. They come from these parental parts of the organism. Trace them up here to the paraphyses. We can also find the ascogonium. Here it is. And out of the ascogonium, you see I love this material. I'm not letting you go today. Here are the dikaryotic hyphae. And so what you can do over the time between now and next time 
is follow those dikaryotic hyphae up and you're gonna find that all of the stages of karyogamy through meiosis, here's our first stage of meiosis, they're all represented there in that diagram. So go and try to find those here and we'll talk about those processes next time. Okay, Ascomycota, we've got a good deal to do today, so we're ready for lab in an hour. So I'm gonna finish up the Ascomycota and I hope get all the way through the lichens. So you remember in the Ascomycota, we have these organisms in the Uascomycota, Uascomycetes, I have the correct name of the class, where plasmogamy and karyogamy are separated from each other. The anthridium and the astagonium are going to fuse with the migration of the nuclei. That's going to produce a dikaryotic hyphae. And those dikaryotic hyphae are going to produce the assi. And that's about where we are in the process. Looking at the ascus production, we see here in this very nice diagram that we've got in the green, the monokaryotic primary mycelium is forming the majority of the ascocarp and then just some of these cells in the ascocarp are formed from the ascogenous hyphae, the hyphae that grow out of the ascogonium following plasmogamy and those ascogenous hyphae are dikaryotic. And I ended last time by saying that this diagram is so nice because you can find at the tips of those ascogenous hyphae you can find all of the stages of the formation of the ascus. There's one, here's another, etc. Let's break those stages down now with some other more diagrams and then we'll come back to that diagram and find them again there, find the stages then there. So make it a little simpler with some simpler diagrams. So here we have a dikaryotic hypha. Hypha would be the, the singular of hyphae, plural. And you can see at the tip of that hypha, there is a hook that's forming. So this is gonna be the process of ascus formation. And that's gonna take place through crozier or hook formation. Crozier means hook. And it, <clears throat> if you are Catholic or raised Catholic or maybe Anglican, I'm not sure, you might have seen a bishop sometime walk into a church or a basilica and he's holding a big <coughs> hooked thing and that thing is called, the crozier, that thing on the top, that very ornate hooked, hooked thing is called a crozier. So it has given us that same term in religious regalia. So the hook, it forms a crozier, and this then, that hook there is the crozier. And you can see that there are two different nuclei in there for the dikaryotic cell. Now that crozier, <coughs> there's going to form cell walls. So the crozier bends over and mitotic cell division takes place and two new cell walls form. So here are new cell walls in black. I'm not gonna draw that second arrow. And you can see that we have mitotic cell division or mitotic nuclear division. And eventually there will be cellular division that separates that into three cells. So we're going to have, in the end, three cells. Here's one, two, three, and over here, although there's a cell wall that's disappeared here, here's one, two, three. And you know what that means. Three terms for that? Yep, three terms for that, in fact. Now, I'm not gonna hold you responsible for these terms, but they are just so cool that we have to cover them. 
but don't worry, they're not going to be on it. These terms for these three cells are not going to be, but they're going to be so cool that you're going to want to use them. You're going to want to work them into some English papers or in another discipline. So the N cell, this tip cell here, is of course the ultimate cell. The tip, the ultimate, that's it. No more beyond that, ultimate. The second cell is not quite the ultimate. That's going to be the cell that's going to form the, that form the ascus. Notice here, there's our dikaryotic ascus that's going to form from that number two cell. So this is the really important cell. So that's the penultimate cell. And means almost. So almost the last, second from the last. The third one, and here's where it just gets great, is the third from the last. So it's the anti <coughs> penultimate cell. Anti before, and you know that perhaps if you have studied U.S. history, the ant, the, you know that there are along the Mississippi and in the South there are antebellum mansions, anti before bellum the war. So, anti penultimate, almost before the one before the last, the one before the one that's almost the last, third one. In other words, so that's you just got to use that word in some English paper and just see if you get a reaction from your teacher. I, there's got to be a way. I've worked it, I've managed to work it into a governance document at UNCG. So now our promotion documents have anti-penultimate anti in it. So our three cells, the ultimate, the penultimate, and the anti-penultimate, of those, the most important one is the penultimate cell. And that is going to form the ascus. And that's the important point we want to see here is we want to see that this crozier formation, this bending over of the tip, <coughs> forms that ascus there because that process of bending over, we're going to see that again, something very similar to that when we do the basidiomycota. And it's going to be very, very important in the life cycle of the basidiomycota. Now it's important in the life cycle here, crozier formation and the formation of that diploid ascus. But it occurs in just a very few cells. In the basidial mycota, it's going to occur in every cell. Very similar process. So that's why we go through all of this stuff, so that you, not just because it's important here, but it's important in other groups. So we end up through that process of the meiotic, mitotic nuclear divisions, the formation of these cell walls, and the formation of this dikaryotic ascus from the penultimate cell, we end up with a dikaryotic Ascus. And here it is. Just drawn in a slightly different way. That dikaryotic ascus is the place where karyogamy is going to take place. So here's karyogamy. The fusion of the two haploid nuclei. And that's going to produce, then, our diploid ascus. And that diploid ascus is then going to undergo meiosis. Here's meiosis 1. Here's meiosis 2, or the results of Meiosis two, there's our four cells. And you recall to get our eight cells, we have to have a mitotic <coughs> division. To produce eight cells, we could really circle in a way these last two and say that's the mitotic division because that gives us our one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight ascospores, which are haploid. 
So we go through our di we go from our dikaryotic mycelium through this process of crozier formation, the oval hook, dikaryotic ascus from the penultimate cell, karyogamy in that penultimate cell. You can just think of it as the cell, the tip cell of the, of the hook, vertebral bent cell of the hook. We get our dikaryotic, our diploid nucleus, 2N. Meiosis occurs, we now have haploid nuclei. And then we get meiosis two, which is essentially a mitotic cell division. And again, haploid nuclei, which divide by a mitotic cell division to give us our eight ascospores. And that process of ascospore spore formation is what's shown very nicely in this diagram. So we can find, if we look carefully, here is a tip cell of a dikaryotic hyphae. There's the tip of a dikaryotic hyphae. That's gonna form, that's gonna bend over in the process of crozier formation. There's actually a couple diagrams that show crozier formation. So you do need to know crozier formation. You don't have to name each of the cells. Within that crozier, here, there is karyogamy. And karyogamy then leads to and there's several cells that show this here. Here's our diploid ascus. There's another one there, and there's another one there. There's several drawings of that. Meiosis one is here. Kind of running out of room to write, but meiosis two is here. And then here's the result of the mitotic cell division. And that finally leads us, leaves us with our ascospores which are the haploid spores, haploid non multiple spores. So make sure you can go through this and find all those stages. Here, the other thing you might do is you might go through and just look from left to right and label each stage. What stage is that? What stage is that? What stage is that? What stage is that? Etc. Another way to test yourself on this diagram. Here's our life cycle. We're ready to understand it. We've got three stages instead of two. We've got plasmogamy, karyogamy, and meiosis. So one of our lines would go like this, one would go like this, and one goes up here like this, although we don't want to include asexual reproduction. After karyogamy, we know that it's diploid, so this is our diploid stage. After meiosis, I've got my meiosis line drawn a little bit wrong, maybe like that. We know that this is haploid. Although you see that they've drawn this structure in two places, and you know that that ascocarp has got haploid portions and dikaryotic portions to it, so don't get confused by that. It's not a perfect diagram here, but <clears throat> you've got the idea that after meiosis, <coughs> The spores, at least, would be haploid. After plasmogamy, then we have the dikaryotic phase. We know that plasmogamy involves the ascogonium and the antheridium, and the migration of the male nuclei into the ascogonium.
that we're going to end up with over here we've drawn this already the dikaryotic hyphae growing out of the ascogonium And here we have then our haploid monokaryotic primary mycelium forming most of the structure of the ascocarp. And that's haploid. Monokaryotic. If we look at the tops of those dikaryotic hyphae, we find our dikaryotic ascus, and that's where karyogamy takes place to produce our. It says diploid nucleus here, but we're saying the diploid ascus in the diploid portion of the life cycle. It's a very short-lived diploid spore portion. It only has that one cell in it. From there, we get our my meiosis taking place and ends up with our four haploid nuclei, followed by a mitotic cell division to give us our eight ascospores, and those eight ascospores then are what are the haploid portion of the life cycle. So this ascocarp really isn't haploid, it's just the ascospores, which are haploid. So it's a little misleading to draw that down there. Those grow out to form are haploid, or monokaryotic haploid mycelium. It's also called a primary mycelium. monokaryotic and the cells are haploid and they are what are going to form our ascogonium, ascogonium and antheridium. So it's a complex life cycle. Not the most complex we're going to see the whole semester, but pretty good. We're getting pretty close to having the most complex. Let's draw it out in our form. And now we know we can't just deal with a single horizontal line. We don't just have haploid and diploid phases in this. We've got three phases, haploid, dikaryotic, and diploid. So we need another line, and we're just going to, since it's such a small phase, we're just going to draw it down this way. I'm going to give a little more space for that. And that's the diploid phase. We'll keep our haploid phase at the top and put our dikaryotic, our new phase, down here in the bottom right. Our processes that go from diploid to haploid, that stays the same, that's meiosis. The process that goes from haploid to dikaryotic, it's not syngamy anymore. It's that process of plasmogamy. And from dikaryotic to diploid, again, not syngamy. Syngamy is the fusion of the cytoplasm and the nucleus. Here it's just nuclear fusion, so it's karyogamy. So that's the basics of our of a life cycle of these two ascomyces. And if you can get that much, you can probably get, get the rest of the life cycle pretty easily, remembering a few terms. So we go from our diploid ascus, let's start there. You could even draw a picture of it. With a single nucleus. So there's a diploid nucleus there. And that's going to go under undergo meiosis and that what's going to result then are our ascospores. 
we don't have to draw all the other intermediate stages of meiosis in. We know that there are ascospores there. The ascospores are going to grow out into form our hyphae. And we know that there's got to be an ascogonium and antheridium, so there's got to be plus hyphae or a plus mycelium and a minus hyphae or a minus mycelium. And we're just going to say the plus is what's going to form the ascogonium. Now I'm going to draw an ascogonium here just as more or less a circle with a little lump hair coming up from the top of it before I write ascogonium. <coughs> and you know that the hair is the trichogyne. And on the male side, We also have hyphae that are forming our antheridium. And I haven't left space to write antheridium right here. Antheridium. And those are the organs then that are going to fuse in plasmogamy. I haven't drawn that in, but we don't have to show everything. In our life cycles, we're trying to get the schematic down so that we can use this knowledge we have of the schematic to interpret other life cycles. Plasmogamy is going to give rise to our dikaryotic hyphae or our dikaryotic mycelium. Also called ascogenous because it grows out of the ascogonium hyphae. And that will grow for a short period of time and produce through the process of Crozier formation our dikaryotic ascus. And if we want to remind ourselves, we can write Crozier formation here. That's the process involved in getting their dikaryotic ascus. All we need is one arrow to complete it. Karyogamy takes place in the dikaryotic ascus. And that's it. Life cycle of you ask my seed. Yes? Can you the my pretty much. Hyphae is plural for one of those filamentous strands. Mycelium means the body of the fungus, which compo is composed of filamentous strands. So it's, they're pretty much interchangeable. And then you go from the dikaryotic ascus to the diploid ascus. Yep. So the dikaryotic ascus is where karyogamy takes place, and so we get our diploid ascus out of that. Doesn't change in form very much. The ascus is increasing in size, but there's not huge changes of form. Another question? So you notice there's something missing from this diagram, something that we've had in every other diagram we've ever drawn for a life cycle. You see the missing part? The zygote. There's no zygote. So there's no cell that results from syngamy. No zygote because no syngamy. We have plasmogamy instead, giving us that dikaryotic mycelium. We've got a couple life cycles that I'm going to have to leave for you to interpret. So here's the first of those. And what you should do is you should go out and you should find the different parts of the life cycle, I'll do one of them for you, or maybe we'll do a little bit for you. So there's plasmogamy, there's karyogamy, and meiosis is someplace over here. And with that, you should be able to label the different parts of the life cycle and interpret the different structures that you see drawn there.
asexual reproduction is drawn here more like we would draw asexual reproduction coming off the side of the life cycle. So that's a little nicer. We didn't draw it on our life cycle over there, but it's nice to be seen nicely here. So print those out. Here's the second one. Very different way of drawing the life cycle. It's <clears throat> the author of this life cycle is trying to illustrate by that very big circle on the top that asexual reproduction is really important to these guys. So he's made that committee and committee for part of the life cycle as big as the sexual cycle. So they produce a lot of spores that are asexual. You need to find your three stages. He's got them labeled as different terms here, but they're not too hard to interpret. You know, dikaryophase. What's 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 dikaryophase? What would we call that in our terminology? Dikaryotic. So we have the dikaryotic phase. Yeah, so you can figure those things out, like diplophase, etc., haplophase, and interpret that life cycle also. On this case, you might want to go back and put some drawings in on the side, right? So you can help yourself remember what the structures look like a little bit. I want to leave that to you because we need to go on and talk about another way that these guys reproduce called the parasexual cycle. Now, the parasexual cycle, para means beside, and it's used in, the, in that, the sense here, it's used in the sense of not the main sexual cycle, a secondary sexual cycle. It's really not very complex. And the reason that we consider it in the ascomycota is because even though it's not tremendously important in the ascomycota, the exact same process is going to take place in the basidiomycota. And there, it's very, very important. It is the major way that the basidiomycota undergoes sexual reproduction. So it's kind of a secondary way here. Basidiomycota, it's going to be the primary way that <clears throat> those organisms undergo sexual reproduction. So this is a second way of getting Plasmodium. There's two ways it can happen. It can involve, let me start that sentence again. It never involves an antheridium. So just like in humans, males are irrelevant, more or less. So no antheridium. The male nucleus is going to get there some other way. There is an ascogonium sometimes, but not always. And the process by which this takes place is a process of conjugation. Of the plus and the minus hyphae. So we get the plus and the minus hyphae then coming to lie together, lie next to each other, just like we did in uh, Phylogyra. And a conjugation tube is going to form again, very like in Spirogyra, but now we're not going to get fusion of the nuclei. We are just going to get exchange of the nuclei. So I can try to draw this very quickly. I need a couple colors here, so I'm going to draw, to make it a little faster, I'm going to draw <coughs> these red, which we'll call the plus IP first. I know you don't know where I'm going with this, so it's a little harder for you to draw these. So we've got one little hypha there with all divided into cells and then two that look the same. And I'm just going to do the same thing on the other side. Oops, I'm going to put some dots in there. One dot, one red dot in each cell.
and now get another color. Let's get green. Here's our minus hyphae. And the first drawing has just, again, got one dot in each cell. So there's our monokaryotic primary mycelium, and they're just lying close to each other. Same thing in the second case, except now we've got a little conjugation tube between them. One dot in each cell, our male nuclei. And the male nucleus is going to move over into the female side. And so that's what we're going to show in the last one, the result of conjugation. Again, our conjugation tubes attached. One dot in each cell, except that center cell, and that nucleus now has moved over to the female side. Switching colors again. And so now we have a dikaryotic cell. And one of two things happens. So the first thing that can happen is that dikaryotic <coughs> cells can grow out of that. Dikaryotic hyphae just grow out of that new cell. the dikaryotic hyphae grow out. And the second thing <clears throat> that can happen is really weird. <clears throat> the male nuclei can divide and migrate. So I'll say that the minus nuclei divide by mitosis and migrate to the ascogonium. Ah, see, males are not so rele irrelevant after all, just tricky. <clears throat> Dividing and migrating and through the cells, remember there are perforations in these cell walls. And that gives us then fertilization or plasmogamy in the ascogonium. And then reproduction takes place in the normal way. I know we're over time for a break. We just have a lot to do today because of the quiz. So let's look at that in our, our diagram. If we can modify this diagram to, be, to show the parasexual cycle, we're almost done. So there is no antheridium here in the parasexual cycle. So we can just cross that out. There can be an ascogonium, and we're just going to consider that there's an ascogonium for this case. And here we have, in the parasexual cycle, what would happen here is plasmogamy. So if we were to modify that, we would have to show at this place where there if they are crossing or coming lying close to each other is that we would get the process we've just drawn out. Conjugation would occur. Plasmodium and conjugation. And then our male nuclei would move so the male nuclei now are, are moving here so we can get rid of this whole male hyphae here at this stage and the male nuclei are migrating in. They migrate into the ascogonium. Pretty weird. A secondary way of reproduction, of getting plasmodium here, in the astromycosis through a process of conjugation. I think I'm going to stop there with the ascomycota because we're not going to finish the lichens if I don't. The last slides are just reminders of some of the structures we've seen already. They're just repeats. We've got conidia and conidiophores here. This one shows it a little bit. There's our 
echinidia, there's a echinidia for different kinds of ascocarps, apothecia in this case. This is called the golf ball fungus. It's a tropical fungus, lots of apothecia around the side of that. And then here is an apothecium. You can find the parts in that, the paraphyses and the assi. And here it is up closer, so you can see very clearly the assi and paraphyses over here. And a parathecium, and the parathecium in the next slide again. As I say, we've seen, I think, all of, all of those slides, or almost all of those slides already. 